We are um, really excited for this final session. It is meant to be an interactive opportunity uh, for you guys to really reflect on the nurse practitioner vision for tomorrow recommendations and to be involved in some, um, some opportunity to talk about it with each other and then to um, talk about it with us so that we can really start to prioritize those nurse practitioner vision for tomorrow recommendations. This session is going to be um, led and moderated by Doris Grinspan, our RNAO CEO, who you guys all had the pleasure of meeting this morning, as well as Dr. Alyssa Ladd, who is joined us now. Hi, Alyssa. She's on mute there. Um, so I'm going to quickly introduce Alyssa and then we'll get into it. Uh, we just have a little bit of a background on the Nurse Practitioner Task Force and a high level overview of the recommendations to help refresh uh, your memories before we get into our breakout groups. So Alyssa, um, well really Dr. Ladd, she is a nurse in, has been a nurse in healthcare settings around the world. She volunteered with mid midwives in a maternity center in Lima, Peru, served as a commissioned officer with the Indian Health Service on the Navajo Indian Reservation and worked in refugee camps on the Thai Cambodian border. Her global work continued with the context of her academic career as a consultant in the development of an NP program at Walter Sisulu University in South Africa and as a Fulbright Scholar at Manipal University in South India. There she served as a professor and mentor to students and faculty in the College of Nursing, focusing on research and nursing practice innovations. She went on to create an academic partnership between Manipal and the MGH IHP, which now supports bi-directional student and faculty immersion programs. She has received funding from the US India Educational Foundation to promote expanded capacity in interprofessional health professions education. Dr. Ladd's research focuses on practice and policies that pertain to nurse prescribing in domestic and global arenas. She has lectured and published widely on policy topics that relate to pharmaceutical practice and advanced practice nursing. She is a member of the core steering group of the International Council of Nurses Advanced Practice Nurse Network and was recently appointed as a co-director of its Global Academy of Research and Enterprise. Dr. Ladd was recently inducted as a fellow into the American Academy of Nursing and in 2019 was the recipient of the Inspiring Global Nurse Academy Global Nurse Award, pardon me, by Nurses with Global Impact at the United Nations. So a warm welcome um, to Dr. Ladd. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, together, you and Dr. Doris Grinspan will take us through the slideshow. We'll start with Doris on the NP Task Force Vision to, for Tomorrow membership. You're mute, Doris. Okay, thank you so much. First of all, thank you very much to um, Elisa for uh, being my hip to hip, um, not joint replacement, but uh, <laughs> partner in crime in leading a fantastic task force and to the, all the panelists uh, in the task force, some of whom are here today and some of whom are not. Uh, it was tremendous. It was a fantastic experience. It was filled with uh, both uh, knowledge and passion, and hence the results uh, for the report that we produced. The report was released, as you remember, in February at Queen's Park. So we are not planning to go really uh, very much in detail about the report, uh, except of saying that uh, this was the time. And of course, with the pandemic, we now know this was the time when we needed to look uh, about what's the next phase of, um, of NPs in Ontario and by extension, especially with Elisa's um, engagement at the ICN level, also internationally and nationally. Um, the, report had, the report had 20 uh, leaders, uh, some of them that come from practice, uh, NPs of course, from various sectors and also um, senior nurse executives and faculties of nursing, not necessarily aware in peace and from various sectors. Uh, it, had rep it has representation from long-term care, public health, indigenous health, I think we saw today may cut here, uh, from primary care, of course, correctional facilities, uh, from policy roles, academia, mental health and addictions and acute care. And we look really at absolutely everything 
for the go forward for nurse practitioners. Uh, and the, the task force is not over, meaning the task force is over, but they're now uh, a formal advisory to see that the recommendations move forward. Uh, next one, please. Um, thank you so much. The methodology that we uh, did for the report was multifaceted. Uh, first, we identify very strategically the stakeholders, uh, both to bring the lived experience as well as the role expertise, as well as um, in some instances, of course, also the research expertise, the policy expertise, etc. Um, we conducted cross-sector environmental scan uh, of what had been happening for the last few years with nurse practitioners, um, much, as, much similar to what we said in the morning with the commission in Morocco, uh, all the many, many reports and uh, what has been operationalized, what continue to be the barriers and what needed to happen uh, go forward. Uh, we also did tons of consultations throughout the writing of the report, both in terms of focus groups, in terms of uh, survey, etc. We did a thematic literature scan to see what was happening and what is happening with NPs, not only in our country, but in other places, what we could see that they were opportunities that perhaps we had not looked and we deliberated and deliberated. And um, what was beautiful to me in the deliberations is it was how one pushed the other, right? To think, to think beyond what we know. So for example, one, one example that vividly remains in my mind is the role of NPs uh, in Ontario health teams, right? So not the role of NPs in each one of the sectors, but across the sectors. Uh, that was a critical discussion that we had and a discussion that we spent quite a bit of time because it really pushed the agenda to look at the P uh, as a system leader in addition to being uh, a clinical leader. Next one, please. Very important um, is, a, of course, here is the task force and some of the consultations. Next one, please, because uh, we already discussed the NP symposium. We brought that to the symposium. A variety of focus groups. I don't want to spend too much of the detail in that because it's all described in the report. This I do want to spend time because I think this is where uh, the promise of NPs going forward lies. Uh, this is what, what you actually, let's stop for a minute. And if people that were not in the task force can write in the chat for a second, what, what is it that is at the center there with the, fours, the four quadrants? If some people can write in the chat, what, what does it remind you of the four quadrants? Anybody that wants to write, please go for it people that are not in the task force. And I'm going to ask also, what is, if you can use your cursor, uh, Catherine, because I don't have access, I don't have a um, shared uh, screen with you. Uh, what is it around the four quadrants? What does that signify? Can anybody say that? Especially if you are in peace. Can anyone, anybody say what are these four quadrants representative of? and what is around the four quadrants in colors, what is representative of. Integration, that's very good. Anything else? Healthcare teams, interprofessional collaboration, very good. Anything else? Thank you for offering all of that. Social determinants of health. Okay, wait a minute. Whoever is saying, Anna, you are saying social determinants of health. Can you tell us which part, if the blue parts or the circle around are the social determinants? That's right. So let me explain. Thank you. Now, now I can be in peace today. Um, I think all of us that were in the task force because it's difficult to know without being highlighted, right? So let us explain. The four quadrants in the center, center is what's called the quadruple aim. And it's called the quadruple aim. It used to be the triple aim. It was transforming the quadruple aim. Basically, it means about 
clinical outcomes, right? So clinical outcomes of patients. It means about uh, patient experience. That's the other quadrant. It means about um, outcomes of financial outcomes. That was what was in the inception of this model, the triple aim. What was added by some of the troublemakers like RNO and others, uh, the quadruple aim is also the provider experience, right? So in this case, 10 piece experience, but we are talking about the interprofessional team experience. That's the four quadrants. And around that is the SDGs, right? Uh, so absolutely social determinants, environmental determinants, issues like poverty, etc. And what it means, if you look at the white piece, that's where we locate the patient being patient or being community or being country and the nurse practitioner anchored in looking at his or her practice within the four quadrants that we're trying to achieve of pushing the quadruple aim in the context that nothing of that will produce good results unless we look and are anchored and are embedded in social determinants in SDGs. So that is the model. If anything about this presentation you can live with, if you can live with this model and then go back and um, Catherine or Irma Jean, if you can please put the, the link to the report, look at that report because we did a beautiful description of this model and this will bring and peace to a completely different level of practice. Many of you are practicing already in this way. If I think about Maycat working with indigenous communities, if I think about Tara in Ottawa working with um, human trafficking, by the nature of the work, if I think about uh, Besuini working with correctional facilities, by the very nature of your practice sometimes, of where your practice is located, you are already practicing that. But if you look at that NP, for example, um, in an ICU, that she or he may not be thinking about looking at, you know, the four quadrants in the context of social and environmental determinants of health of the SDGs. So this is really unique. This is how we are going to push anything that we do in the future with NPs. And trust me, because you will hear more at the AGM, we're bringing very good news for the AGM. And again, it will be embedded in this type of framework that is not only the quadruple aim, but in the context of the quadruple aim in the context of SDGs. Next one, please. Um, the objectives of the task force are very simple in a sense to highlight key roles and sectors of NP utilization in Ontario. Now, you can understand that in the context of RNO, we are not only looking at absolutely all the sectors, no stone and turn on that. We are also looking at an emphasis on vulnerable populations, which has been very apropos to the NP role, especially NP led clinics, since the moment that RNO was pushing for NP led clinics years ago. Uh, to propose strategies for full integration of NPs across sectors and domains of practice, right? So not only within the sectors, but that's where the OHTs also come to play. To identify facilitators and barriers to the NP role optimization currently that we need to tear down uh, as we have done for the last many, many years and go forward. So that with one aim in mind, to advance timely access to care and to improve quality of care and quality of outcomes. And to identify needed changes to remove those barriers to NP integration in Ontario system now and well into the future. I believe that um, uh, Dr. Latt will be taking it from here on to the recommendations if I have good memory on the slides. If you can turn to next one, Kaya. <clears throat> All yours, uh, Dr. Latt. Thank you, and thank you. It's great to see you all again, and I'm so glad, Doris, that you're continuing this really important work. I can't wait to hear what's happened after the next year, so keep me posted. Um, <clears throat> so just in terms of the um, recommendations, the broad, um, broad 
uh, general recommendations that um, were uh, essentially came, that the, the group came up with is um, one is to increase supply in the province, optimize utilization, which is very important, um, expand scope of practice, align the curriculum to the important um, practice needs, harmonize compensation um, across the board, invest in research, broaden insurance coverage when appropriate, and showcase the impact of what nurse practitioners do. <clears throat> so I'm going to go over um, all of the individual recommendations. Um, there were, I believe, eight, correct, Doris? Yeah. So um, the first one is to increase supply of nurse practitioners across all sectors and settings, importantly. Um, the second one is to optimize the utilization of nurse practitioners within their current scope. The third was to expand the scope of practice for NPs. Uh, the fourth was to align NP curriculum with expanding scope of practice. Uh, the fifth, to harmonize upwards NP compensation across all sectors and settings. And I really like the term here, upwards. We always need to be going upwards. <laughs> um, the sixth is to invest in research to support NP practice and improve health outcomes. The seventh is to optimize access and continuity of care by ensuring all insurance benefit carriers Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and other such payers accept NP services analogous to physician counterparts. And recommendation eight is to showcase the impact of nurse practitioners through public education campaigns to advance full utilization of nurse practitioners across all sectors and settings. And here is the picture of the group when we finished our work and it was the last in-person meeting actually that I went to and it was uh, the beginning of um, February, 2020. I, I think was the last meeting that any of us had in person. Yeah, and the rest is history, isn't it? And the, well, I hope that is not history. I hope it will go away otherwise really. I it's well, really I mean, it's our, 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 our recent history, yeah. <laughs> I know it feels yeah. sometimes that this is history forever. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I want to comment for a second before the group activity about the comment <laughs> of uh, Dr. Lat about she likes that we say upwards. Let me tell you why we say harmonizing upwards conversation. There was a time, once upon a time, that NPs in primary care were the lowest paid and hospitals were better paid. That's not the case now many times. So rather than saying what we used to say is that NPs in primary care need to be compensated like in hospitals, we now decided that our renewal, we say harmonize upward, whoever, you know, like if you're go, we need to harmonize across all sectors to the one that is the highest uh, at this time. So that's the, the rationale of really specifying that we, what we are talking is not just harmonizing, but harmonizing upwards to the to the highest paid and peace in the system. Because sectors may change with time where they right. get, we may gain here, then the other one is the lowest. You know, the bottom line is all of NPs. And goes back to what our colleague Shirley Sharkey um, that was in the morning with us mentioned. The same should be for RNs or for RPNs. People otherwise navigate to the place that they are better compensated clinically mm -hmm. rather than where they have the passion and the <clears throat> Can I just make a quick comment about that, Doris? I think that is such a good point because generally speaking here in the U.S., the nurse practitioners that get paid at the highest level are the ones generally speaking that do acute care. So they're in hospitals. But the question is, why is it that the nurse practitioners in hospitals are getting paid more? Does that mean that their work is more important than say my work is in primary care? I mean, I don't think that that should be the case. So, and, and then if you compensate for any kind of provider to go to an acute care setting, that's where they're gonna go. 
So I do think it's really important to kind of even the playing field because there's no one sector or place of, of employment that's more, that's better than another one or should be incentivized more. So well, and, and look at the problem then in long-term care right. where really there is an urgent need for NPs, right? So here mm -hmm. you that's exactly the rationale. So uh, we gain from you. Here you can gain from us. I was just going to Thank say that's something that I'm going to take back to my groups here. <laughs> yes. yes. I know there will be a lot, a lot of work that we will continue to do together. So stay tuned. Mm -hmm. Lots of good is coming, as I said, at the AGM. Okay. So um, we will do an exercise now and Catherine will guide us through the exercise where we want you to prioritize. Basically, we want you to struggle a bit with these recommendations, look at them, we will not give you a lot of time, and help us prioritize. This is one point test, don't think that this will be what will guide the, our entire work, but it's an important point test. We have almost 80 of you uh, here, so it will be really good if we can get your input. Catherine, back to you. Thank you, Doris. And thank you so much, Alyssa, as well, for giving us that quick overview of the task force. That really was a nutshell, um, but a really great overview. So thank you. We are going to move into breakout groups. There um, are 78 of us. So we're going to move into, let's say, eight breakout groups, and there will be um, about 10 per group. We'll ask that the first person that arrives to the breakout group will be the facilitator of the group. The second person that arrives will be the recorder. So writing down. Um, I think people will back. stay behind. <laughs> no, we'll make them. We'll make you guys go into the breakout rooms. <laughs> It'll be a fun exercise. Um, what we really, like Doris had said, um, what we're lo really looking for is your input on these recommendations because we want to hear from you. What are the most important recommendations for you right now and why is that? And we want to know um, where you would like us to start first with an action plan moving forward. So this is really our opportunity to hear from you about the recommendations and we will be using your feedback moving forward. So please take, take the time um, in the groups to, to talk about it. Um, you should have received this workbook over email. It does um, have in the email, there's a link to the workbook. Beth Sweeney, is um, she's got it on display. You can do it um, electronically on your computers as well. And Lauren has just put a link to the workbook in the chat. So please open, click on the link and open the workbook before we put you guys into breakout rooms. And that way you'll be able to see all of the recommendations in full and in brief and answer these uh, three questions. So we'll give you, just like at the time, we'll give you um, between 10 and 12 minutes to do this. And then we'll come back and we'll have a quick chat before we close out the session. All right, um, so Lorraine or Anne-Marie, if you could please uh, break the participants into rooms, that would be wonderful. So please click join. Thank you guys. We'll see you when you come back. Okay, so before you left, we did assign a facilitator and a reporter. So hopefully, or sorry, a recorder and a reporter. So hopefully um, some of those groups did actually, in fact, record some of their discussions and are willing to share some of the, some of the conversations they had around recommendations and prioritizing the recommendations. So I will put out a call um, to any one of the groups to share what they discussed during the breakout session. I can report on group three. Perfect, thank you, Shannon. All right, so, um, our group, the first point that we talked about was um, the importance of expanding our practice. Um, and there was some frustration expressed about, you know, having been work, working in this field for a number of years and having, you know, the quality of care that we're providing and not, um, and still being limited when it comes to ordering CT scans and MRIs and having some of those limitations to what we can do. So expanding our scope of practice was one of the first points. The second point was um, pay equity. Um, well, equity in general between the different areas of nurse practitioner practice. So specifically between long-term care and community practice um, as that limits the ability to attract nurse practitioners specifically to long-term care because of 
some of the inequities in the pay structure and the and the ability to work to full scope in those practices. Um, then we discussed um, billing and salary structure and how this is uh, this is a barrier for even community sectors, especially you know nurse practitioners working with family health teams and with doctors, and having you know not having a set structure and how we can be salaried or billing like billing for our services so that we can be paid properly and not have um, have issues with how to work with doctors. So I think that you know. And I think our whole group also would agree that, you know, there'd be an increased uptake of nurse practitioners into family medicine and into primary care clinics if there was a structure set in place for billing um, to allow nurse practitioners to work to their scope, um, as well as addressing some of the inequities of how the um, things like PAPs and the special, the extra fees that family health teams receive for their promotional, like their health promotion activities that don't, they're often being done by nurse practitioners, but not getting that money is not getting to the nurse practitioners. And my own personal piece that I add to this is that I am a nurse practitioner eager to work independently as a psychotherapist, as a psychotherapist nurse practitioner. And so having the billing structure changed and you know, my dream would be to be able to apply to the Ministry of Health to work independently on a salary so that all of my clients could just come and see me on their own and I wouldn't have to bill indiv like individually for each person. And on top of all of that, we also talked about research and how important it is to showcase our success as nurse practitioners and the quality of care that we provide and to continue funding the research. So yeah, we talked about all that. <laughs> that was good. And hopefully my team members will add to the chat if I miss anything. Thank you so much, Shannon. We appreciate hearing what your group discussed. Thank you very much. Are there any other groups that would um, like to tell us what their group chatted about and how you prioritize the recommendations in your discussion? I can uh, present for uh, group five, I think we were. Thank you, that'd be great. Uh, so we had some great uh, dialogue um, to get right off the bat. The first. Um, the first one was to look at access for NPs across um, health sectors, particularly targeted populations. Those uh, have been identified as uh, vulnerable populations or where there's been an identified gap in services. Um, making sure, I mean, we know that there's nurse practitioners that are available and looking for full-time work. Um, so making sure that those, that those nurse practitioners are, are into those positions and then the rest will fall with this. Uh, number two was NPs full scope of practice, point of care testing, MRIs, BMDs, uh, as well as insurance companies, forms, et cetera, um, and making sure that we continue to, to follow and to put, um, make sure we're communicating with the people that need to be communicated with to make sure these changes are put into place and not put off. Uh, number three was harmonizing NP compensation across all sectors, ensuring pay equity, making sure that the, predominantly nursing is a female um, dominated workforce and making sure there's um, that gender equity and pay as well. But um, just making sure that also we're represent, we're being paid for the scope of practice that the, the role has um, advanced it to be able to provide the services to the populations that most need it. Uh, and then number four was to invest in research to support the NP practice and improved health uh, and so that's, it's imperative that we continue to do the good research to look at, um, certainly it's good to take a look at, um, uh, focus more mainly around health outcomes and how the NP role can address and improve the health outcomes of the individuals that were, and populations that we're providing care to. And was there, a, was there a number five guys in team five? I think that was it. I think you did a fantastic job. We did a good job, yeah. Great to hear that you guys had some lively discussion. Yes, Beth, go ahead. So I was the uh, recorder for group eight. So everything that everybody's already spoken about is like off, obviously uh, what we spoke about too, but number one was that uh, 
of the interest for um, the um, pay and the fact that yes, there are jobs out there, but even so the unions for the NP um, positions are very low. So we have to advocate for that. There's absolutely no way that a NP with eight years experience should only get two weeks of holiday and the wage is so low. So um, uh, NPs are keen, they see even the corrections that this is where it's blowing up right now, lots of job opportunities, but low union wages. So we know that we're needed. We love to work in the underserviced areas. That leads into the next thing is, um, is the fact that we'd love for a new call for proposals from the government because there's so many underserviced areas that the nurse practitioners would be able to um, provide expert care. And, the, and the, what is important at this time is that when we spoke about COVID and the, the, the mess up that the government has done with not figuring out how nurse practitioners could be part of the vaccinator plan. I mean, doctors uh, are billing and uh, RNs and RPNs should be those giving the injections with an NP and an MD doing the running of the clinic. I mean, uh, I wish I wrote down the word that the very first uh, presenter this morning talked about, and he said it in a sentence that he says, just because it is that way shouldn't be the way we're doing it. And that's the fact that the docs are, are the billers and that they got that role not okay. Now next is really important to our group is uh, academic curriculum. And, the, and, and the, the group felt rushed in the current program, really rushed, really wanted to know if we're at where we need to be as far as um, academic standards. Uh, there were some people with uh, a large, long time since their BSCN and coming into that with all of the pathophysiology and um, regular physiology, it's a lot to handle with such a heavy program already. So um, that's in a nutshell. Last one was that number eight. They felt like docs do a really good uh, uh, job of showcasing themselves. Everybody knows what a doctor is. And we felt that if uh, the RNAO could showcase nurse practitioners, increase public awareness, um, this would all kind of go together with all of the wonderful recommendations. And thank you for the time. Excellent. I just wanted to add, I was from group two and um, we did have some discussion on one of the key um, items we discussed, it's funding because there are some nurse petitioners who are unemployed and we don't even know the, how large a number those nurse petitioners are. So to get funding from the government to hire these nurse petitioners. The other thing is pay equity across the different sectors because that's problematic. Um, one of the MPs in my group said she was seen doing primary care with pediatric patients. She was not paid, the doctor paid her from his salary or her salary because she was seeing all these um, primary care cases in pediatrics. And it, of course, she wasn't paid from the government services. And she said even the RPN who was working in this practice got higher pay than she did. Those inequities really need to be addressed. Thank you so much, Angela. And Beth as well, thank you for sharing the thoughts of your group. Who would like to go next? Let's hear. Hi, it's Christine. I can ask uh, group sevens uh, because it adds on to what Angela was saying. We agreed that funding and showcasing our abilities were incredibly important because we need to get across to the public and the funders how important we are and what we can do. Um, I think a large, well, we agreed that the largest barrier for us is to actually find positions that are funded. So we um, we actually rated that quite high. We, we agreed that all of the other points were very important. And we rated the uh, recommendations to showcase the impact, harmonize compensation, increase supply, broaden insurance coverage, optimize utilization, align the curriculum, invest in research and expand the scope. And we chose um, expanding the scope and the uh, curriculum as lower level for us to address 
simply because we felt they were already starting to be addressed and optimizing the scope story was along with that. And that's all for group seven. Thank you, Christy. <clears throat> I can speak. Um, I honestly cannot remember what group we're in, but there's only three of us. I think maybe group three. Um, I mean, we really touched base on everything everyone had to say initially. Our, what we were hopeful for was um, optimization, like optimizing utilization and increase in supply. So um, one of the people in our group, like she's been struggling to actually get a job as an NP because of the lack of experience that she's a new grad. So can't get experience without a job and has applied to over 50 different positions and continues to get not hired because of the lack of experience. Um, so that's a huge, that's very disheartening. Um, how are we ever expecting our, you know, NPs to ever become, you know, fully utilized NPs if they can't get positions based on experience? Um, and then our second one that we are hopeful for is really compensation or like harmonized compensation. Um, so when you can work as an RN and actually make more money um, as an RN versus an NP, there is re like, why would you take on more responsibility, a bigger scope um, to make less money? And I, we know it's not all about the money. These are things that we've you know, we did discuss, um, but it really is a deterrent to going into practice. Um, when, you know, when I first started, right, you're making easy $11,000 a year going from an RN to an NP. Um, so those were our two big things. We didn't get a chance to go through everything. We we're kind of hoping more people would join. Um, but there was another really something that I've noticed is showcase impact and not so much I think to the public, I think there's a good area to showcase what MPs can do um, and our scope to the public. But I think it really needs to be driven hard to doctors, to management, to people higher up. Like this is our scope, this is what we can do. There's no need um, for us not to be integrated into those places because we are a huge asset to hospital settings, primary care settings, community settings, all the above. Um, and currently working uh, on incorporating an eMERGE position at a small rural hospital, um, the director of patient care and the CFO and the CEO were just blown away by the documents I provided from the RNAO and the NPAO based on our scope. They had no idea we could do what we could do. So I feel like really showcasing our actual scope of practice is really important. Um, so those, yeah, those are kind of our big ones. So really just the, um, optimized utilization and the pay equity. Thank you, Trisha. Are there any other groups that would like to present what they spoke about in their breakout room? I think I was uh, with group four. I can chime in. We didn't have a lot more, um, unique things to, to like to bring it to the table, but I do want to highlight that we um, definitely agreed that um, optimizing utilization is very important in, in increasing access to clients without family providers, especially those that are identified as vulnerable populations, um, is, and specifically in long-term care. Um, but what was we identified was that optimizing utilization aligns with the upward harmonizing of compensation to ensure retention in these areas with greatest need that also align with the clinician's expertise and interests. Um, and uh, I think we also discussed the importance of utilizing the um, public's understanding um, of, of nurses and, and long-term care, especially that what has come out of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is an opportunity to showcase the wonderful work that MPs are doing um, in order to leverage um, towards policy changes. So I think um, that kind of summarizes what our group spoke about, but please chime in if there was something I missed. Thanks, Danielle, that's great. Wendy? 
Uh, so I was in group six, I think, and uh, uh, very interesting. I, I, all the other NPs there were new grads, um, young, younger NPs that haven't been in it. Uh, but I think we all have the same similar goals, optimize utilization, harmonize compensation, increase supply were the big ones. And then we talked a lot about uh, supporting new grads. I think uh, they spoke very openly about how complex the people they're seeing are, and they were not so sure they felt prepared to manage the complex uh, with their program. So I think that's really important for us to understand as NPs who've been around for a long time and have kind of found our niche. And when you listen to somebody like Hudu talk about what she does, right, like that's a that's a niche um, and we don't get there overnight. Um, so just being a little bit careful with that expanded scope piece, especially uh, because I think a lot of us have built to that expanded scope, um, but it's, uh, we are uh, graduating NPs to a huge scope now. Um, so I, I just, and how can we support a, a new NP and knowing when they need to consult and when they can make a decision. And especially when we talk about CT and MRIs, I used to always think, okay, if I need a CT, that means in my head, I need to consult, right? If I'm at that point, where if you don't have any of those limits to practice, uh, you've got to be pretty good at knowing when you're a little over your head, which <laughs> um, I, 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 that's just a cautionary that uh, came out of ours. Thank you, Wendy. That's a really important point for us to consider. I, I want to comment on that. Wendy, while you are correct, the same was at the beginning with anything in the practice of NPs. NPs were afraid of much less than that even. And that's no different for an arena on other things, from novice to expert. Yep. And within the role that you are, you need to know when it's above your head. You know, regardless if the rule is to consult or not. None of us should be doing practice, whether it's in policy, by the way, or whether it's in clinical practice or whether it's an arena or an RPN. So I would be cautious a bit. I, I, I say this because uh, a home without a medical director and without an NP is worse than a home without with an NP. And it doesn't, and, and that came a bit across Morocco Ask me after. Should, should we be concerned about saying NPs in medical director? No, because not every MP will be ready. And those that will apply is because they can be medical directors. And some are novice and cannot be, uh, you know, can not be in, in independent practice. Others cannot be in long-term care. Others cannot be. So I think always we need to know that we need to practice within our scope. I would be cautious of not putting um, blank statements about let's be careful about MRIs or CT scans or, or being a medical director or for that matter being an attending MP. At the beginning, I remember when RNO proposed the attending MP. Let me take you back even worse. When RNO proposed the NP-led clinics at the beginning, we were shot. I can show you the emails. Shot, okay? That we were out to lunch what we were asking. Well, we have 26 NPLED clinics and I wish we had a hundred. I wish we had a thousand actually, because they're doing amazing. And while at the beginning we had doctors consulting, most of them do not need that doctor to consult today. So always, it's no different than a family doc needing a specialist, right? So I think we need to be, we need to be, um, cautious on the statements and make them, you know, make clear that people understand that regardless of what's the specific task or procedure or sector or, um, or scope um, allowance, that if you are not safe on that scope allowance that is, is authorized by legislation, you simply don't do it, yeah. right? I think that's the critical piece. And then some will be ready with many years of experience, et cetera, et cetera. And even if the layer of being ready is this small, just picture the, the goodness that will do to the system that now has nothing. And some can practice in, in, with indigenous people, others cannot because they, they don't have the expertise of working with indigenous people. It's not only an issue of scope, it's an issue of of 
knowing with whom you are working. So I just, I just, um, I'm not saying let's go wild and let's go pure courage, but I think a dose of courage and allowing the, 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 the practice to continue to flourish is critical. Because even then, if not point of care testing, why would we do it? Not everybody's ready for that either, right? So I think a, a piece of, of, of reflection on the issue of novice to, to expert. And even when you are expert, sometimes you will not feel confident on something. And that's fine. That's fine. And I just like to add, Doris, well said. And I've been a midwife for maybe over 40 something years, as long as, as I've practiced. And I've worked in maternity in isolated places. And there are people come to me and even physicians would ask for a second um, assessment. So people should not be feeling threatened if they have to ask for a consultation or a second opinion. Two heads are better than one. And if you're unsure, you could ask. There's nothing wrong with asking. I do just want to add as a novice NP, kind of novice, I guess I've been working for five years. I feel quite comfortable. I'm surprised by the complexity of patients I'm seeing because I work at a CHC. Um, however, I have no problem knowing my limitations and consulting when need to, or even calling the on-call specialists through our hospitals. But the problem that I see is that I feel like I work as kind of like in a very similar scope as our physician colleagues, but the compensation is so much lower. That's the part that gets me. Um, I love challenges. I'll always be able to take on more unless I feel like I can't, then I'll be the first one to admit it. But the compensation, just like what everybody else has echoed, is what makes it difficult. I am. I, I love the fact that we're fighting to um, expand our scope of practice for CTs and MRIs because there are times that I 100% know that that's what's needed to that that's what needs to be done next, and so the consultation is just because that's you know me practicing within my scope. Um, but at the same time, I hope that as we expand on our scope, uh, the compensation also matches um, with that. Thank you so much, Anna. Before we move to questions, are there any other groups that are waiting to provide some uh, overall thoughts from their discussion in breakout rooms? Okay, why don't we move to Tina? So I was just gonna say that for the new grads in particular, and I think it's been answered here in the chat, but basically, you know, what I have found with students and what's been helpful with new nurse practitioners that I've worked with is mentorship. Um, and realizing that after about almost eight years in an MP role here that when I'm, you know, even consulting with MDs that I work with, most of the time when I'm consulting them, they're telling me to consult. <laughs> with a specialist. So you do get your feet under you eventually, right? With that, and that gains confidence if you're working under with a mentor. Um, so, I mean, it's good that you posted the information for mentorships for new nurse practitioners, because I think if you're on your own and you don't have someone else with you, uh, that's really daunting. Yeah. yeah. Any remaining groups that would like to provide any final thoughts or any other questions before we close the session? This is very helpful to, to really then bring it back as we prioritize the, the um, recommendations and again, to be clear that doesn't mean we will do one and not two and not three, because even when we are doing some parallel, an opportunity may come where this, the perfect timing to push something else, right? Uh, because of what's happening in the context, et cetera. So that's the example, for example, with long-term care now, right? So opportunities, uh, fortunately and unfortunately, because some come out of crisis, will continue to um, 
to come about. And, um, and I think if you can remember the model, right, of the quadruple aim with the SDGs around, as you go around in your roles, you will be able to bring us new ideas. You will be able to bring us uh, examples, lived examples of where your practice made the difference because you were anchored in that center of, you know, pushing the quadruple aim uh, of clinical excellence, of, of cost effectiveness, of patient and provider satisfaction, and also in the context of social determinants of health, given that many, many of you practice with, with clients that are in uh, less well-to-do, let's put it that way, not to say marginalized, but less well-to-do communities. So it's, it's a tremendous opportunity. And as we move out at some point, hopefully, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't, it's difficult to picture it now, but as we move at some point out of COVID, that's not going to go away because when RNO speaks about recovery for all, right? Um, not always we have recovery for all. So you guys will play a critical goal, role going forward too. And we will make sure to worry about the aspects that will make your job better, your job uh, more enjoyable, your job more supported, your job more fulsome. So you don't need to be fighting with barriers and also well compensated because absolutely you, you, you earn that you deserve it. You know what I mean? By, by what you do, not just by earning, but by what you do and, and the contributions you make. Thank you, Doris. Alyssa, I wanted to give you the opportunity to provide any closing thoughts before we move into our formal closing of the Institute. Um, I think that all of you have brought so many critical ideas into um, what I see as your expanding role. And I think that one of the I think that this particular report and recommendations are really going to be the fire that ignites the role, in a sense, in your province. I'm really excited to see what happens in the next five years. So thank you again for having me. Thank you so much, Alyssa. We're so glad you're able to join us. So now we will uh, really go into our formal closing of the session. So we uh, are just so thankful to all of our informative speakers, um, to all of you who have joined us for your amazing participation and for your attendance. We are very much looking forward to your feedback, which uh, we will put a link in the chat in order for you to provide um, some feedback via survey. I will just pass it quickly um, to Doris and then to Sally to do some final closing remarks. Doris, you wanted me to go first? You go first. Okay. Um, Thank you everyone for coming today. I certainly do hope that we met your expectations. Um, I'm not going to read through the objectives. We can all read them ourselves, but I do hope that you can give us uh, feedback on the survey, whether we met the objectives um, from your perspective and let us seriously know because that will build our future um, opportunities for future institutes and also our um, uh, insiders that we do monthly um, or bi-monthly help us guide what you need to know and learn. Um, I know I myself, I was privileged to join the um, MRI and CAT scan session just because I was the moderator, but I do apologize to those who were not able to join if you were hoping to do so. Certainly look at the videos of any of the other sessions that you um, missed because uh, I'm sure there's tons of information that we could have learned from the other sessions as well. And if we had two or three days, we'd all have the opportunity to see each and every one of those sessions. Um, so um, if you also are interested in becoming involved, um, please look at the positions that are available for the NPIG executive. We wish that we could have all of you on board so we can become stronger, but allow the exec to be one of those points of um, uh, being a voice. And uh, thank you again to RNAO for the support of making the NP community a valuable member of RNAO and a valuable member of the healthcare um, practices in our uh, province. And I also see that the task force uh, report um, is an opportunity for us 
to be trailblazers, not just for Ontario, but for Canada, because we are the highest uh, NP population in that f workforce. And uh, we can actually help guide Canada um, in this as well. Over to you, Doris. Thank you, Sally. Thank you very much. I will uh, echo Sally's comments and build on that. There are uh, close to 2,000 NPs, members of RNAO. Uh, a reminder for you, which I didn't say all day, but I better say it. If not, Daniel Lau will be very upset with me. And maybe uh, Lorraine or, or you, Catherine, can put the $100 promo there. Uh, the link, please. Please tell your colleagues, those that are not yet members of RNAO, to join. It's the perfect timing. It's a hundred dollars promotion included, uh, inclusive of PLP and all taxes. So that is a good opportunity for you to bring uh, a, a, an even stronger voice of NPs to RNO. Um, I hope that alongside the day today and what we did in November, which was also fantastic, and Catherine, thanks for organizing both, and to Lorraine and to the team. Uh, thank you very much, and to also Imagine for helping uh, with the report and the task force, to the entire team at RNO, uh, thank you for the tremendous work. I do want to remind you that there is a position open. You do need to have some expertise in uh, policy, uh, but let me be clear, uh, you don't need to be an, an expert in policy. You just need to be a good writer. You need to write well, the, less you can, the rest you can learn with us. Uh, it is a position targeted to a nurse practitioner. Uh, and that person will be taking a bit, you know, um, all the initiatives that we're looking at pushing forward. Meanwhile, of course, we are moving them forward anyways, but we want the person really focused on the NP files and the many, many aspects that uh, we have in mind for that. So if you are interested, I think uh, it's there in our own careers. If you cannot cut and paste, or if you know of colleagues, uh, simply send me a WhatsApp. Uh, I am going to put my WhatsApp there. I know one person already connected with me, so here you go. I'm going to put my WhatsApp there so that you can, if you have questions about the position or anything else, uh, absolutely do that. The only way I answer is WhatsApp these days. Um, so here you go. And uh, that's the number for the WhatsApp and that's also myself, but the uh, do WhatsApp is better. Uh, I would ask, leave you with one um, important aspect that we didn't discuss today and is take it to social media. The impact that nurses are having in social media today is incredible. Uh, I don't know if you have seen some of the latest uh, social media stars, whether it's Birgit Omaga or whether it is, there is one that is a podcast called Gritty Nurses. There is another one that just started this week to nurses and a dog. They're all fantastic and trust me, it is. It will change in in months to come. The perception, not the perception, but the advocacy that we can do as a whole. One thing is action alerts. And by the way, was I ever delighted that Commissioner in Morocco knew knew even about action alerts? Never in our life we have really included him in an action alert. But I was just thrilled. Uh, equally important to action alert is social media. If you want to follow me, here is mine. I will follow you back. If you want to follow RNO, here it is. RNO will follow you back. And I know Beth is very active. Imagine is very active. Uh, Angela is very active. Please put your your tweets, your Twitter accounts there. I put mine and RNO. Let's follow one another and let's give voice together. Talk about the role of NPs. You don't need to say my patient name was so-and-so. You can say, as I saw, -da 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 -da. here is the complexity of the person. Here is where we were able to do. And then you can say, if I could have done ta-ta-ta, -ta -ta, that my role doesn't allow, right away he, would, he or she would have gotten treatment. Or on the other hand, you can say, because I could see him right away as an NP, here is the results that are so good. 
take it to social media. People pay attention to that. That's what politicians are looking these days. In fact, government put two people dedicated to that, to follow people in social media. All governments do, it's not just this one. All governments do, we do that. We do that at RNO. So take it to social media, always keeping patient confidentiality, absolutely. Uh, but share, share, you have expertise, you have richness, you have passion, you have knowledge, you have expertise, share it, share it, share it, share it, please. And let's go together because I think, uh, Elisa, you will be surprised. It will not be five years. It will be less than five years. In Ontario, we started this movement really in terms of the legislation in 1996. It started before, but the legislation happened in 96. And if you look, at, that is the fastest growing category of nursing and the largest is in Ontario. Uh, we will match and surpass you. Uh, I'm looking at the U.S. because you guys really know in terms of supply, not necessarily in terms of scope, but in terms of supply, you do know we are going to copy you in terms of supply and then you will be able to use us in turn in terms of compensation or in terms of scope, etc. Together we are stronger, guys. Together so we are stronger and we will keep going on it. So let's let's um let's be in touch in two years then. So I think that there's going to be significant progress in two years. You will be in touch before okay. two years because you are part part of the advisory <laughs> now. So you are not off the hook so easily. Um, stay in touch, guys, um, and let's keep together pushing forward. And again, if anyone is interested in learning more about the position, by all means, send me a WhatsApp and I will connect with you. Thank you very much for a fantastic uh, day. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us. We hope you really enjoyed the event. Take care, be safe. You too.